Good morning, everyone. It's time to begin, and our first song will be number 717. Number 717. First song this morning. And if it's convenient for you, would you stand as we sing this song? Blessed rock of ages, trusting now, dear Lord, in thee. Keep me till my journey's ended, till thy blessed face I see. Hide me, O oh, the rest of ages, till thy blessed face I see. When the storm around me rages, rock of ages, hide thou me. Keep me when the storm clouds gather, till the sun comes shining through. Keep me till my work is over, till I bid this world adieu. Hide me, O oh blessed rock of ages, till thy blessed face I see. When the storm around me rages, rock of ages, hide thou me. When my journey is completed, and there's no more work to do. Savior, guide my weary spirit. Happy land beyond the blue. Hide me, O oh blessed rock of ages, till thy blessed face I see. When the storm around me rages, rock of ages, hide thou me. Be seated, please. Next song will be number 725, 725. <clears throat> joyful sound Jesus saves Jesus saves spread the tidings all around Jesus saves Jesus saves bear the news to every land climb the steep and cross the waves onward till our Lord's command Jesus says, Jesus says, sing above the battle strife. Jesus says, Jesus says, by his death and endless life. Jesus says, Jesus says, sing it softly through the He craves, sing and try, he'll pour the tomb. Jesus says, Jesus says, give the wind a mighty voice. Jesus says, Jesus says, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. 
highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory, Jesus says, Jesus says. Next song will be number 67, 6, 7. And after this song, we'll have a prayer. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. God, we thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for the beautiful day that we have and the blessings in our lives, Lord. We just thank you for the, the family um, here, Lord, and, and the opportunity that we have to come together as a family and to uh, sing praises and to uh, worship your name, Lord, and, and not to have um, to, to worry about judgment outside of here, God, or, or people coming in here and taking us away, Lord. We can uh, worship freely, and we just thank you for that opportunity. Uh, thank you for the uh, the beautiful weather cooling down and the animals that we have and, and all the beauties that we have around us. Just let us uh, remember to give you thanks and glory in, in, in all those opportunities, Lord. Uh, be with us this morning and let us have attentive ears and uh, allow us to um, look into our lives, Lord, and to make judgments and to uh, evaluate ourselves, Lord, and to be challenged to uh, do better and to grow. Uh, be with us throughout the week. Allow us to look to you for guidance in all that we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Next song will be number 317 or 317. And after this song, we'll have the Lord's Supper. Tell me the 
story of Jesus right on my heart every word tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth glory to god in the highest peace and good tidings to earth tell me the story of jesus right on my heart every word tell me Sweetest that ever was heard, fasting along in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how far our sin he was tempted. Yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised in the Good morning. This is a time in our worship service that um, 
is basically the focus of our service. Um, this is the main reason we're here. I want to, as I was doing some research and, and I wanted to look at basically three aspects of the Lord's Supper. One is the memorial. And, I, and I've spoken on this before that, that when he said, you know, this do in remembrance of me, he knew that as, as humans, just as the song we were just led in, tell me the story. You know, stories, that's how things are kept alive, is their stories. And I hope that continues with this new age of social media and stuff being on our phone. And, and when our phone is gone, it's like we lost it, you know. But tell me the story and the stories of, of you know, grandparents sitting around telling stories of things. Tell me the story of Jesus that keeps our memory. When we actually take of the cup, take of the bread, these are symbols that we actually touch, helps to stimulate more of our memory. So Jesus basically said, do not forget. Do not forget me. Do not forget what happened. As it says, on the evening he was betrayed, he was eating a meal with his disciples. He took some bread and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Also, with the supper, he said, this is a cup. This is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So, for one thing, it's, it's a memorial to remember what Jesus went through. And I always, I did some study on the amount of time physically what he went through. And that, that can be a whole sermon right there of what he went through but he had he started praying that night he was up all night he was taken to the different uh, places and he never slept after that then came the, the the scourging the torturing and this is after he'd already been up all night so he was already totally fatigued and he knew all this was going to happen yet he still let it happen he knew this was going to happen he knew the worst form of death, he was going to experience the worst form of death that was known to man. Yet, he voluntarily did it. The second part is we come together as a family. And I know one of the songs that, that I love, I really can't lead it anymore because my voice doesn't get that high, but Joey led it last week about Come Share the Lord. It talks about, we gather here in Jesus' name. And then in the chorus, it says, we are now a family of which the Lord is head. And what's really neat about this right now is you think, all across the nation, all across the world, given our time differences for the most part, people are doing this. You know, I think of my brother up in Michigan, you know, at some point in the next 30, 40 minutes, they're in this same process we're doing. Other churches are doing this, so it's it's a family, and so we are we share the Lord as a family. One of the things we do is we have time to reflect, and that's and I like that you know where there's time because yes we are as a family, but yes there's a time where you do individual reflection. And as um, First Corinthians eleven twenty eight, it talks about um, a man ought to examine himself. You're to examine yourself. Now, obviously, when I examine myself, I find all the faults that I have. I found all of my shortcomings as I examine myself. Thus, almost needing Christ's blood to save me from myself because as I examine myself I, many times 
and I'm assuming most of us like we don't we look at our shortcomings and we we fall short. And so that's a part where it talks about examining ourselves. The third part reminds us of Christ's return. Where he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we'll be doing this until he comes. And so these are three things at, on this memorial feast that we can all share in as a family. Let's pray for the bread. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that out of your love you gave your son to voluntarily die on the cross for the remission of our sins. We ask this as we partake of this bread that you help us to self-examine ourselves to take us in a, a manner worthy. In your son's name we pray. Amen. pray with me again. Father, once again, we can't thank you enough for what you've done for us, what your son has done for us. We ask that at this time, as we partake of this fruit and vine, which represents the blood that your son shed on the cross for us, please help us to realize this, help us take it once again in a manner that's worthy. In your son's name, amen. This goes back to my Church of, Christ, Church of Christ upbringing, but the famous statement, separate and apart, that many of us have heard. And I was discussing with my wife, and no, I'm not going to say everything that I discussed, because she said, you better not say. But we've done this, and I said, I grew up in the Church of Christ. We, we've done the collection because the people that passed the plates around were already up here to do the collection. And so it was a convenience to, while the, they were still up here, they did the collection. So it's never, and I don't want us to think this is part, this is the third part, you know, the bread, the cup, the collection. It's not. It has nothing to do with the one. It was just a convenience. Uh, it was just, it was a management thing, a convenience thing. But at this time, we, we do uh, have a chance to give back. Um, and I don't think, you need to look around you if you don't think we're truly blessed. Because if you don't think we're truly blessed, I'm, I worry about you because we are a truly blessed nation. We are a truly blessed people. Um, and I hope we, we can share our blessings with, with others as well. 
Um, but this time we have a chance to give back to the workings of the church. Um, there's a box in the back. You can put it in there, or you can uh, go onto our website and donate online. But let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, we truly live in a very blessed nation. We are a blessed people, Father. We're here, air conditioning, comfortable seats, um, our cars, of which we probably have more than one of. And um, Father, we, we want to thank you for those blessings. We're your children, and we want to give back to you. Father, you don't need, you don't need our money. It's in our heart, Father. It's what our heart gives. And Father, we ask that we give freely. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you're using the song books and like to mark the song after the lesson, it'll be number 923-923. And we'll now sing number 264. And if it's convenient for you, would you stand as we sing? Also, our young folks are dismissed at this time for youth worship. I want to live, dear Lord, for Thee. Oh, keep me every day. A faithful witness, let me be. Along life's rugged way, take my hand and lead me. Spirit, feed me till I'm safe at home. When Satan would my hopes alarm, oh, shall turn thou my soul, protect me with thy mighty arm. Thy strength will keep me whole. Take my hand and lead me anywhere you need me. With thy spirit feed me till I'm safe. At home, let me each day thy spirit fill, increase my courage, Lord, to walk by faith, endowed with sail, directed by thy word. Take my hand and lead me anywhere you need me, where thy spirit feed me till I'm safe at home. Be seated, please. morning. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 5. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. For that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive 
the obedience of Christ. Good morning. If you're one of our guests today, we certainly are glad to have you with us because you've come to the friendliest church that you could have come to on this Sunday where my wife and I are celebrating our 10 years, our 10 year anniversary, anniversary, serving God with the family that meets here at the Meadows. 10 years. We, in that time, we've seen some beautiful babies born. We've seen some loved ones pass on to their reward. We've seen hundreds of prayers answered. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do next. We are currently in a study on Paul's letter to the Philippians. And in this, this letter, in the fourth chapter, which we began a couple weeks ago, we have seen that God is teaching us how each of us is to live our lives each and every single day as a citizen, not of the city of Beaumont, not of the United States, not even of this world. We are called to be citizens of heaven. In fact, in uh, the latter part of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul wrote and said, For our citizenship is in heaven, is, not will be, is right now in heaven, from which we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think uh, Mike said it well. We truly are a blessed people. So far in this fourth chapter, we have seen some things about how citizens of heaven are called to live here on earth. We've seen so far that we are called to stand firm, stand firm in our faith. We have called, been called to live in harmony with each other, although sometimes that's not the case. In verse 2, we see where a couple of sisters by the name of Yodi and Syntyche were not getting along well but they were called to live in harmony with each other. And because of things like that, number three, we have seen that we are called to restore godly relationships with each other as well as with others. We are called to live a life that is filled with joy. Remember, joy is not dependent upon anything that happens outside of us. Last week, we heard Joe call it circumstantial joy. Our joy doesn't come from our circumstances. Our joy comes from our relationship with God through his son, Jesus. And if that's right, then what we expect, what we feel, is our joy in the Lord. We are called to be known for our gentleness in our treatment of each other as well as with others. And we're called to live a life that's characterized by prayer, not by worry. Lots to worry about even more to pray about. So today what we're going to do is we're going to see how we as heaven citizens are called to have a particular type of mind in regards to our relationship with heaven. What kind of mind should we have? Well, this is what we're going to be looking at today. We're talking about characteristics of heaven citizens, and now we're called to have characteristics of our thought life. What is it to be like? Well, in verse 8, he tells us some things. He begins by, this is me now speaking, this is not uh, God's word here, but understand first that our thoughts determine our behavior. You do the things you do because it was something that you thought about doing. And so you chose to do that behavior, and, and whatever we think is what we become. We're not schizophrenic where we're thinking over here and doing something else over here. We become the things that we think. So when we uh, control our thoughts, we're going to control how, how we live. And if you don't like your life right now, my encouragement is change the way you're thinking. Change the way you're thinking. This is what we're going to be talking about today is how we, how we think. In the Old Testament, the wise man Solomon in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 said this, As a person thinks within themselves, so are they. As we think, so we are. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 said, Do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed is to take the shape of something. Don't take the shape of this world. But be transformed, be re changed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what the will of God is. That it is good. It is acceptable. God's way is perfect. 
So let's go ahead and look then today at what should be going on inside our brains. What should we be thinking about? In verse 8, Paul begins by saying, Finally, brethren, whatever is true. Whatever is true. Things that are true are things that are real. Things that are genuine. Things that are not fake or counterfeit. They're not fugazi. That's the real deal. And so we should be thinking about true things. Eve, when she saw that tree, well, she saw it not for what it was. It was forbidden to her. It was forbidden. She saw it, though, the way she wanted to see it. She thought about it, and she saw it in a particular way. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, we're told that when she saw the tree, that it was good for food. She didn't know that, but in her mind, oh, that must taste so sweet. It's a delight to the eyes and certainly desirable to be made wise. And after thinking along those lines, she took the fruit and she ate it. And she gave to her husband with her. And he ate it. Now understand, God had told them the truth. Early on in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, God had told Adam, he says, that from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but not from the, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. You know, for when I first became a Christian, I read that. And then also I read then chapter 4 and chapter 5, and Adam and Eve were still alive. And I thought, well, wait a minute. God said, the day you eat it, you shall surely die. Did he forget? What's going on with that? Well, fortunately, God's patient with people like me, and he said he'll eventually keep reading and find something that he should, and I did. In Romans chapter 6, in the first part of verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. Now, he's not talking about physical death there. He's not talking about some sort of flat line sort of thing. He's talking about eternal separation from God. And so our wage, when wages is what we get for what we do. And so when we do sin, what we have earned, the wage we have earned, is eternal separation from God. The Apostle Paul reminded the Christians in the city of Ephesus about who they had been prior to becoming Christians. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. And so Adam and Eve that day, they did die just like God promised. They were separated from God just like he said would happen. You see, Satan lied to Eve. He told her she would not surely die. Now, she had never been lied to before, so she didn't know the difference. She just knew that she had two conflicting thoughts. One came from God, and one came from this snake here. That would have been enough for me, I have to believe. But, you know, God said you'll die. He says you won't. But he told her what she wanted to hear. Her mind was working in that direction. Satan will lie to you, brethren. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus tells us Satan is a liar and the father of lies. When we tell a lie, when we say something that is not true, what we are doing is we are taking after a father figure. We're taking after a father figure. Satan has become our father, and so we are acting as though we are his children because he is a liar and he's a father of all lies. He'll do that to us. But when we focus on things from God's perspective, when we listen to what God has to say, then we'll know the distinction between that which is truth and that which isn't. In his prayer in that upper room before going to Gethsemane, Jesus in John chapter 17 and verse 17 was praying for his apostles and for us. And he said, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And so this is why you'll hear uh, preachers and Bible class teachers and church leaders always encouraging people, now read your Bible. 
Don't forget to read your Bible this week. Most, most of y'all have probably a, a special time of day. Some people like to do it when they first get up in the morning over a cup of coffee. Other people like to read their Bible at night after the day is done and, and, and spend some time with God and his word and in prayer, things of that nature. But the reason we read our Bible is because that's where we find truth. This world doesn't tell us the truth. This world tells us lies. And so what the Apostle Paul and by extension, our God is encouraging us here in the first part of verse 8 is whatever is true. That's what we need to be thinking about. He goes on to say, however, whatever is honorable. Whatever is honorable. Honorable things are things which are revered. They're noble. They're highly respected. There is a dignity of holiness around things that are honorable. This is contrasted, of course, with things that are flippant, are cheap, things that lack honor whatsoever. But what we should be striving for are the things of honor. It is much like Paul said in Romans chapter 2 and in verse 7 when he says, Though who by perseverance, that means keeping on, keeping on, who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, and honor seeking after glory where does that start right up here we seek for glory in the things in which we think immortality eternal life we seek what we think next he talks about whatever is right whatever is right the word for right uh, is the base word for which we get such words as righteously righteousness things like that. And so that which is right is things that from God's perspective is righteous. So when we're doing things that God considers to be righteous, we're doing it because we're thinking about the right things in regards to those, those issues. Now, typically what happens, and you all know this, typically what happens is the world takes what they want us to think and what they want us to believe, and they take, take that thought and then they spin it. They kind of mold it or shape it to a way that a lot of people will say, oh, well, I didn't know that. So that's the way that is. Okay, I see that now. I get it. They take something sinful, they take something evil, and they make it sound right. I mean, good grief. Uh, accepting sinful lifestyles is being inclusive, isn't it? Isn't it inclusive to, to think about people with sinful lifestyles and just bring them in saying, yeah, you know, it's okay, it's all right. I mean, good grief. Sinful relationships, they, they, they term those relationships loving relationships. And then when you, you mention that this is not really right, they'll say, wait a minute, you're the one that tells us God is love. And isn't this love? Shouldn't we say that this originates from God? But to call something right, to call something loving that God calls an abomination, that is not right. In Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22, God tells us that certain behaviors, certain relationships are not righteous. They're not right. And whatever you spin you want to put on it, God says it's wrong. This is wrong. The people, God loves those people. As Mike was going through the, uh, the Lord's uh, prayer or the Lord's supper here that we had and our thoughts on that, he's reminding us that, yes, we do sin, but God has called to us from a hill called Calvary, and God has called for us to put our sins where God wants them. Allow his son to take the punishment for what you and I have done. We say, I, I don't want to do that. It makes me feel bad about what I have done and what God had to do to replace it. Yeah, it should. That's exactly how we should feel. That's the right way to feel. We should feel terrible guilt so we could want to run, not just walk, but run to God, run to that throne and, and ask for his forgiveness. Oh, I, you know, sometimes people say, beg forgiveness. You don't have to beg. God is eager to forgive us. He loves you, and he knows you better than your spouse, 
better than anybody knows you. Because, see, he knows what's going on in here also. And yet God chose to allow his son to take the punishment for the, what we did. So, yes, we need to think about what's right. You know, there was a man in the Old Testament, most of us are familiar with, a man by the name of Lot. He was the nephew of Abraham, the great head of the faith. Abraham, there are three world religions that consider Abraham to be one of the founders of their faith. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Abraham was a big deal. And he had this nephew by the name of Lot. And, and Lot and his wife and two daughters, they were living in some pasture land, but their tents were kind of facing towards Sodom. Sodom was the city. I think we all have heard about Sodom. Sodom was uh, known for its wickedness. In fact, we get the word sodomy from the name of the city of Sodom. And so ultimately, Lot took his family and they moved to the city of Sodom. You'd say, well, that was a rather stupid move. But how does God picture Lot in the midst of that awful situation? In 2 Peter chapter 2, in verses 7 and 8, it says, Righteous Lot. Oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among, among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their sinful deeds. We live in a world that is a sinful world, but what we need to do is become like Lot. Brethren, we cannot allow our minds to become numb to the sin that is in this world around us. Notice it says that he was oppressed. His soul was tormented. He recognized this was not right. This wasn't what God desired for them. And, and, and it broke Lot's heart that this is the way those people were. And so we need to make sure that what goes on in our minds, we think about things the right way, the way that God sees those things, we need to see them that same way. Because as I said, if we see it a different way, then we'll act a different way than what God wants us to act. If we do think the right thoughts, we will do the right things. It really comes down to that. The problems that all of us have, and some of you may have some prevailing sin in your life where you say, Rick, you don't know, I have tried, I have done all sorts of things, I have I've done all that I can, and yet I still can't get past this one sin in my life. What you need to do is you need to change your thinking because as a person thinks, so are they. You need to change how you think, and if you have any questions about that, get with me after services or give me a call this week and let's, let's discuss them strategies that God has for us in those regards. So things that are true, things that are honorable, things that are right, things that are pure, things that are pure. Things that are pure are things that are morally clean. They're spotless, undefiled, free from filth and of dirt. They are pure. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, Paul writes and says this, abstain from every appearance of evil abstain from every appearance of evil. Now, what that means is that when you are someplace and evil appears, this is where our, our uh, to our youth, boy, I noticed Labor Day, some people are taking a long weekend, aren't they? Man, I'm looking around, all these empty chairs. Wow. But, for instance, our youth group, their parents say, hey, go ahead and go to the party, but if there's something there, that shouldn't be there, if somebody's smoking something that doesn't have a filter, or if uh, some people are drinking adult beverages, or whatever the case, the thing to do is leave. That's what we're called to do. If there's something sinful going on, leave. People telling jokes in the workroom at, uh, at your, uh, where you guys work, the lunch area, or something of that nature, if they're telling things they shouldn't be telling, leave. Just get up. Don't make a big deal about it. Just leave. You see, we can't escape this world. 
Jesus in that same prayer I mentioned earlier when he was praying for his apostles. In John 17 and verse 15, he says to his father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, how do we do that? We keep ourselves from Satan by not allowing them in here. We don't want Satan to be in there. Remember, we need to protect our thoughts. In, in the scripture reading that Roland read a few minutes ago, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, it says we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If there's a thought running around in your mind that God doesn't want to be running around in your mind, don't let that thing run free. You need to bind that thing. You need to tie it up and throw it into the darkest recess and put a lid over it that you nail shut and then park your car on top of it. We need to stay away from every thought and take the ones that are only in obedience to Christ. Those are the ones that we need to hold on to. Don't let the wrong kind of thinking have free reign in your mind. Okay, let's see. True, honorable, right, pure, lovely. Lovely. Lovely refers to things that are pleasing. They're endearing. They are appealing to us. But as I've mentioned from the very first part of this uh, Philippian series, you've got to watch out for those things that aren't going to be appealing. Things that are going to rob you of the joy that you're called to have in Jesus. Watch out for joy stealers. People and circumstances. Those are things that will steal your joy. Stay away from gossip. Criticism, fault finding, and negative judgmental attitude, because that stuff ain't lovely, that's ugly. And we need to stay away from the ugly. You need to instead be an encourager. Encouragers build people up. They motivate and inspire people. That's what encouragers are. Encouragers are a great asset to, to the church. Because they're, they, they just seem to have a knack for seeing somebody who, who needs some encouragement. They come over and they put their arm around them and they say, you're doing such a good job. You're awesome. You're doing great. We need encouragers to help us keep on keeping on. In fact, we need to tell encouragers when they're encouraging that they're doing what's great. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, Paul writes and says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. Don't wait for somebody. Don't try to catch somebody doing something wrong. Catch them doing something right. And tell them you appreciate and love them because of the service they are offering to the Lord's people. The next thing he says is, And whatever is of good repute. Good repute. Good repute refers to things that are worthy. Thoughts of the highest quality. We mustn't listen to bad reports about others. You know, even if it's juicy. Even those juicy things. You need to not listen to that. Once again, Solomon says that those kinds of things, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 8, that the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. Don't listen to bad things. Oh, I know. Sometimes people, you know, I mentioned a few moments ago gossip. And I probably have told you this before. But sometimes people sanctify gossip. Oh, I'm not gossiping. But I did want to tell you about Sister Jones. And, because I want you to pray for her. But you know what Sister Jones is up to. And then all of a sudden, they're telling you all sorts of stuff you don't want to know about. The way you stop that is you say, I didn't know. Hey, look, there's Sister Jones right there. Come on, let's go talk to her. Gossips don't want to get caught. They certainly don't want you to be talking to the, the person about what they said to you. Gossip. Terrible. It's not, it's, a good re, it's not a good repute. You know, they could be reports, the bad reports, could be about people that you either know personally or people that are known to you. It's because of that second one of those that, now some of you might say that I'm just naive or maybe ill-informed, but I have stopped watching national news and cable talk shows that are of a political bent. I don't do those anymore. And you know what? I, I kind of feel a little bit better about some things. I, I still read stuff online that I pick and choose what 
I'm going to be reading, but you've got to watch those kinds of things. You see, bad repute can deal with us in a wrong sort of way. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 5, he says it this way. He says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Don't you know Satan's going to be whispering in your ear and trying to get you to do some of the wrong sorts of things. But those who are according to the Spirit, on the other hand, they set theirs, their mind on the things of the Spirit. You see, the things of the flesh, the mind that's set on the flesh is death. Once again, we're not talking about some sort of cardiac flatline. We're talking about separation from God. The mindset, if you have a mindset on fleshly things, lots of things could be considered here. But you end up in the wrong place. But the mindset on the spirit, ah, life and peace. It's much better, so much better. Finally, Paul writes and says, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. A dwelling is a place where people live. All of us have a dwelling. It might be a car. It could be a tent. It could be a Winnebago. It could be whatever it could be. But we all dwell. We all stay. We live. We abide. We remain there. So what Paul was saying is that these things, things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise, that let your mind think about those things. Remain there. Those things should be the focus of our thinking. Heaven citizens, that's what they do. We control our lives by controlling the things that we choose to think about. And the things we choose to think about are those seven things that we've, we've already seen this morning. In fact, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 that if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. You see, the minds of heaven citizens dwell on those things and they walk above the crowd. We're not down in the mud where most people do their thinking. We walk above that because we have chosen how we're going to think. And that's just verse 8. Well, the good news is verse 9 is not quite as uh, filled with stuff, but I want to share some thoughts with you regarding that. You see, verse 9 talks about the characteristics of our active life. And what Paul's going to do is, once again, give us some examples to follow. In the first part of verse 9, Paul writes and says, The things which you have learned and received. Here he's not talking about himself. He's talking about others. Things that you've learned from others, you've received from them. And he's talking about spiritual guidance. Remember we saw back in chapter 2 and verse 20 where Paul says uh, regarding Timothy who is going to send to Philippi. He says, I have no one else of a kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Timothy is who he's talking about. And the welfare he's talking about is their spiritual welfare. How are things going spiritually for you? How are things going spiritually? Because Paul's concerned, and as God is concerned, I know we are all focused on the physical, but the thing that's going to last for eternity is what's spiritual. And so Paul, Timothy, God, me, we're all concerned about how things are going spiritually in your life right now. There are things that perhaps have been taught that need to be learned and received from us by you. Somebody else that he uses is Epaphroditus. Now Epaphroditus is a man who actually came from the city of Philippi. He was a member of that congregation. But when they heard that Paul had been arrested, they said, you know, we need to go and see how he's doing. Because, you know, back in those days, you didn't, weren't in a, a six by eight uh, room uh, with three hots and a cot. It wasn't that way. If you ate, it was because some people brought food to you. And, and so that was the sort of thing. So they sent Epaphroditus to them. Now you remember when we were in chapter two, how uh, Epaphroditus had gotten sick. I mean, almost to the point of death. But God blessed him and Paul and he came through his disease. And so Paul now in, in chapter two and verse 29 of Philippians, he says, therefore receive him. I've sent him back. 
He says, receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. Listen to men like this. You see, when he was with Paul during that time, he learned a lot. And now he has a lot to share. Today, you might say, I don't have Timothy. I don't have any Epaphroditus. Well, we have Paul's letter, both of them, that he sent to Timothy. But we also have something else. We've got spiritually mature people in this congregation. There are people in this congregation who've been Christians longer than I've been alive. There are some people who have probably forgotten more than I know. But we've got some awesome people, and you've probably picked them out. Maybe in a class you heard them ask a question. You says, wow, that was an awesome thing. Or maybe you were uh, talking with some people about somebody you're concerned about, and, and this person was part of the group, and they says, hey, tell you what, why don't we pray about that, and let's come up with a strategy for how we can help her or him. You say, why didn't I think of that? We've got some great people like this. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, it says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Have you learned from people in this congregation? Have you received things from them? That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're called to be about. Then back in verse 9 of Philippians 4, Paul goes on to say, and heard and seen in me. So now he is talking about himself. If you've heard me or seen me say and do things, those are for your benefit. See, Paul doing the same thing that Jesus did. Jesus taught by his example. Jesus taught by his words. And so when he, he says here, the things that you have heard, He's talking about the words that I spoke to you, seen the life that I lived before you. If you've heard and seen those things, you're supposed to do those things. You know, this isn't the first time in this letter that Paul has used himself as an example. Back in chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul said, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the power you have seen the pattern, not the power, the pattern you have seen in us. Our walk is our lifestyle. Paul says, the lifestyle that I have lived. That should give you some ideas. You see, Paul understands he is a citizen of heaven. And so he's living the way that he believes that he's supposed to live here on earth because it's going to be the way he's going to live when he gets to heaven also. In the latter part of verse 9, he says, Now practice these things, what others have said, what I have said and shown. Practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. I think this is neat because earlier in this same chapter, in verse 7, he talked about, And the peace of God shall be with you. So here we understand that not only will the Philippians who obey God's instructions receive God's wonderful gift of peace, <clears throat> but they will also have him as their constant companion and friend. Two verses, but boy, I'll tell you what, if we could get these things down solid in our minds and say, you know, that's going to help because I've been thinking some things I shouldn't think. I've been doing this, whatever. This is where it really does come down to your response to what God has said. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to come to a church building and sit and listen to some preacher drone on. We're called to listen to what the word of God is teaching and then apply that to our lives because that's why God gave it to us. I mean, yes, the things that we read are going to ultimately form the judgment that we receive. Jesus in John chapter 12, it's not in the notes, so don't look for it on the screen. Settle down, Richard. But the, Jesus said on one occasion, in John chapter 12 and verse 48, he says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what's going to judge him in the last day. 
And so what we do is we take the words that, that God has spoken to us and don't think it's just, he's just talking about the red ones. They all, they all are inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. And so what we need to see is this is something that I'm not doing that I need to start doing. Or this is something I am doing and I need to stop doing that. It's how we grow in our faith. And so to the Meadows family here, maybe it's time for all of us to do something of a mental inventory, kind of checking out our thought life and saying, how am I doing? Am I, am I doing the things that God says I should be doing? Thinking about things, only those that are true, that are honorable, that are right and pure, that are lovely, that are of good repute, that are excellent and worthy of praise. Maybe that's where we all need to be, brethren. I kind of think it's going to improve things. It might just improve things that need to be improved. If you are one of our guests today, I want you to understand that changing how we think is not only foundational to living a Christian life as a citizen of heaven, but to becoming a Christian who is a citizen of heaven. The Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 6, in the first verse, he says, What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, we already talked about that, remember? In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, just two chapters later, it says that, you know what? We're not supposed to, the mind set on the flesh is not where it's supposed to go. Those who are according to the flesh, it's not the way we should be thinking. Not thinking that way at all. So back in Romans chapter 6, Paul goes on and says, well, God forbid I should think that way. And then he says that if I have died to sin, shall I still live in it? Of course, the answer to that is no. Now that I'm, now that I, I, I'm changing my thinking, I'm not going to live in those kinds of thinking anymore. God forbid I should do that. To which we're reminded once again in chapter 8, in verse 5, where it says that those who are according to the Spirit... They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And this is where Paul's going with this. So if you're ready, if you're one of our guests today, and you're ready to start changing the way that you think, then what we need to do, what needs to be done, is to die to sin. And we die to sin when we starve our mind of sinful thoughts and we only feed it that which is right. That which is true, that which is pure and lovely, you know. Those are the things that we need to do. Feed the good. Deal with the bad. But you see, we've already thought and done things that we shouldn't have. So we need to understand, if I have died with Christ, then what needs to happen is I need to be buried. And in Romans chapter 6, and verse 3, it says, All who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 4 that uh, as Christ was raised from the dead, as Christ was raised from the dead, so too those who have been baptized into Christ are raised to walk. But now notice their new life, and that's what it is, a new life, raised to walk in newness of life. Why is my life new? Because I was buried with Christ. My sins. Jesus died for my sins. I die to my sins. And so in this regards then is that what we see is that when my life is new is because I'm no longer thinking how I used to choose to think. And thoughts are a choice. I no longer act the way I used to act because I'm thinking differently now. And now my relationship with God is different. Oh, I, I used to be a, yep, got to admit it, I was a, a child of the devil but not anymore. You see, now we can honestly say, God is my Father. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, it says, for you're all sons of God and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 27, he says, for all those who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so if you're one of our guests today and you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know what? It, it makes sense, but I have some questions that he didn't answer, and I sure would like to know the answer to those questions before I do anything else. Excellent, because I know a source that has all the answers, and together I'm sure we could find them. 
And so if you would like to have a time where we could sit down and talk at your convenience, a time of your convenience, at a place of your convenience, then what I'd like you to do is we're going to stand in just a few moments and sing that song that Weldon has chosen. And then I, what I'd like you to do is, is come and have a seat up here and, and just say, I'd like to have some questions answered before I do anything else. Awesome. We'll set that time up. Or maybe say, I'm not going to walk up there. I, I'm not ready for that. Then talk to me after services. I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere. At least not for the next 10 years. Of course, Remy's saying, oh, God. I'm looking around for where's Remy. <laughs> but you, perhaps, though, perhaps you're ready to say, you know what? I'm, I've changed my thinking. I'm, I'm ready to continue to change it. But I haven't been baptized according to what the Bible teaches. Oh, they sprinkled a little water on me when I was an infant. But, but I know that that's not what the Bible teaches. And I'm ready to get right with God. I'm ready to become his child. We're all sons of God. If you're ready for that, then what we're going to do, we're going to stand. You come forward, have a seat on one of these chairs, and let's see how we can help you. Once you come now, while together we all stand and encourage each other by singing. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment a bright day coming, a bright day coming, there's a bright day coming by and by, but its brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a sad day coming, a sad day coming. There's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall bear his name, depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Our next song will be number 809, number 809, and after this song we'll have a closing prayer, and then after the closing prayer we'll have our announcements. 809. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? And in the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? Walking and talking with Christ the Supernal One, won't it be wonderful there? 
praising, adoring the matchless, eternal one. Want it be wonderful there. Want it be wonderful there. Having no burdens to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, want it be wonderful there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time we've had together this morning that you brought us all safely here to, to hear your word and we were able to sing praises and to worship with one another. Father, we pray this week as, as we go out that, Father, you will bring someone in our path and, Father, that we will be able to plant that seed in them, Father, either through our actions through our words or through prayer, Father, that, that they may need. And Father, we pray that we will be imitators of Paul and, and, and the people here that we know that do the good works. That, and Father, we will put into practice those things that we need to do. And so Father, we pray as we go out this week that we will seek the lost, Father, that we will go to them. Because, Father, we know there are many in today's world, and, Father, they need to hear your word. We thank you so much, Father, for Rick, for Remy, for the elders here. And, Father, help us also to hold them up as a, as a light to ourselves, that we can practice what they do as well, and, and we can hear the words that you put in their mouths that come to us. So be with us this week, Father, and bring us back at the next appointed time. For it is in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see each and every single one of you here, especially our visitors. We have some announcements and prayer requests that I want to share with you this morning. First off is that tonight, Lord willing, we will have our singing night, and it starts at 4.30 p.m., and then around 5 o'clock, you can be able to request the songs that uh, you want to hear, and our song leaders will do the best of their ability to lead that song in which you have requested at that 5 o'clock hour. But again, that starts at 4.30 p.m., where we will learn some uh, new songs. This upcoming Friday through Sunday is going to be our Ladies Beach Retreat Weekend. And I need to share some info with you for those ladies who are going or for those ladies who are thinking about going. And here's some of those thoughts. Today is the last day to sign up for that ladies retreat because we need a head count so we can make sure we have enough food. The ladies retreat, again, is this Friday through Sunday. And if you need more information, you can be able to look on the round table in the foyer area. If you, for some reason, cannot come on that Friday, yes, you can still come on that Saturday, and you won't miss a whole lot. So if you're just wondering, I really want to go, but I don't know if I can make it Friday, it's all cool. You could be able to come Saturday, and Lord willing, stay that Sunday. If you have any other questions, our good sister Vicki and uh, Miss Kathy right over here could be able to answer your questions, uh, whatever questions that you may have. Uh, but again, that is this Friday through Sunday. Lord willing, Monday night class is going to be September 11th, not tomorrow, but just the following uh, Monday as far as next Monday, September 11th at 6.30 p.m. So just make a note of that for those who uh, are looking forward to that, as far as those who are always going to that or those who want to go for the very first time. I mentioned last Sunday when it comes to our young people, our, our youth group and their families, that we were going to have a, a planning meeting uh, next Sunday. That is not going to happen because of the Ladies Beach Retreat. I figure that is not wise to do that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to push it uh, forward or push it back, however you want to see that, push it forward to September 17th. So that is the third Sunday of this month. Those who are involved with our youth group, we will have our planned meeting September 17th. Okay, Lunch will be provided. 
but also on that evening, we will have a youth devotional here at this church building. September 11th, a planning meeting, and also a youth devotional here at this building after evening services. So families, please put that on your calendars and make a note of those things. We also have our His Shoes, Her Shoes seminar. It is coming up September 23rd. There is a sign-up sheet on the round table regarding that event. There are flyers on the welcome table, a one that is a normal flyer. If you want to put it up on your fridge or hand it out to your neighbors, another flyer in which you may know of a good friend who owns a business, or you may just want to go to a business you've always gone to and you don't really know the people, I don't know, and you could be able to ask them, hey, can I put this big old flyer here? about our marriage seminar that we're having at Meadows Church of Christ. And Lord willing, they'll say yes. And so there are flyers for that occasion, again, on the welcome desk. Here is a note regarding that matter. It says, I'm so thankful for those who have uh, signed up for the marriage seminar. We've had uh, some signups even from our community. So please be praying for uh, more of the idea of reaching more individuals to come to this meeting from our com uh, community. And so this uh, brother, uh, Brother Guy, thanks all of us for the prayers and us reaching out regarding that uh, seminar. Here's what I also want to share with you. This will be October 1st. October 1st. Did I have that right, brother, Miss, uh, Sister Vicki? October 1st? Okay. October 1st, we are going to be having a teacher workshop here at this church building. Our speaker is going to be Kevin Lankford. Kevin Langford from the Louisville uh, Church of Christ will be speaking on October 1st from 1230 to 4 p.m. We understand? October 1st from 1230 to 4 p.m. This is for anyone who is interested in helping or teaching our children of all ages. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer with more information. Please sign up so we can have a head count. Contact Vicki Mansfield for further information. So sign-up sheet on the round table regarding this teacher workshop, October 1st, 1230 to 4 p.m. Kevin Langford, our guest speaker for that occasion. When it, current, when it concerns our prayer request, please keep in your prayers Eric Keller as he's continuing to recover from his heart procedure as well as Ebony Keller. I don't know if you remember that Ebony Keller Ebony Keller's dad was having that same procedure that uh, that Eric was having. I asked her last Sunday, did that complete itself? She said yes. So she or he was able to have all that done too. So just be praying for Ebony Keller's dad. If you don't remember his name, his name is Rick Verdon. Rick Verdon is his name. Keep praying for the healing of the family of Lynette Bashemi as we celebrated her life uh, last Saturday. Continue to pray for Judith Miller as she has been released from ICU and moved to a regular room. We want to encourage those to send a card to her this week, knowing that's going to lift her spirits up. She's doing really well. But if you would, please send her a card uh, in the mail to her house so that she could be able to, at least her family members, could be able to pick those things up and being able to tell her that uh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is thinking about you uh, this week. Keep in your prayers, Tina Paul. She was supposed to have a procedure uh, just this past Friday, but that had to be postponed because they need some other additional things to be done. Continue to pray for Shirley Peavy and James Chaney. James Cheney, as they're dealing with different health issues, as the uh, also Winford Mays, the co-worker of Larry Paul, recovering from surgery. Continue to pray for Philip Roy and, and, her, and his sister Jeanette Roy as they recover from surgery, and Chuck Lamonte, who has stage 4 cancer. And also be praying for Davis Fanatnot, or Fanat, I can't pronounce that last name, brother. Can you help me? Okay. Okay. We'll be praying for that good family because that individual, Davis, has passed away. So be praying for that family at this time. 
Brethren, that's all the announcements I have for you this morning and prayer requests. Visitors, it is so good to see each and every single one of you. Please take a connection card that should be right there in front of the seat so that we can start building a relationship with you, getting some information with you, and you can be able to lay that down on our welcome uh, desk over there, and someone will be able to pick that up and be able to make contact with you. Please do not forget that we have Bible class after this occasion, and we do have a website, MeadowChurchOfChrist.com, a Facebook page, a YouTube page, and an app in which we encourage you to subscribe and download so that you can know what we're all doing here at the Meadows Church of Christ.